Welcome to Inaudible. My name is Jeremy Wyland, and I'm joined by my co-host, Ryan Masterson. On this podcast, we discuss the weird, beautiful channeled messages found in the archives of LL Research, an organization dedicated to sharing spiritual information with the world. You can find out more about LL Research at llresearch.org. The archives contain transcripts of messages from allegedly discarnate sources who claim to hail from an organization they call the Confederation of Planets in Service to the Infinite Creator. If you would like an audio version of the transcripts, please subscribe to Ryan's other podcast, Living Love and Light, available on all platforms. Ryan and I will try to provide analysis and commentary on the philosophy described in these messages, identifying the common themes, and grappling with the application of this information to our human lives. Thanks for joining us on this journey. Hey, Ryan, how's it going? Doing well, Jeremy. How are you? I'm doing well. Wonderful. Doing well. Thank you for that. We thank you for that nice little plug there. You're welcome. I uh, just think that it's important that people know that both podcasts exist. I think they're nice compliments to each other, but I definitely think if they had to choose one, it would be Living Love and Light. It's most important to get in, uh, exposed to the me- the pure message, and you know, however much good we might do, and that's questionable, right? However much good we might do by offering our commentary, it is an inevitably a distortion. What either for good or for ill, but still a distortion. Yeah, highly so. highly questionable, but <laughs> <laughs> we do our best. <laughs> They're getting their money's worth, so yeah, <laughs> yeah. Boy, it's I kind of chuckle because the last time we did this, you had your fan running. It was hot. Well, now it's hot over here, and we've got all all fans and ace. But it's only like eighty four over here, and it's yeah. still relatively dry. So it's not it's not where you're at. But you know, it's uncomfortable for us Northwesterners. Oh yeah. Well, I'm used to it, but uh, it's just that. You know, it's like most things, right? I can't bear the thought of possibly at some point during this recording being uncomfortable. And like, I just realized I care more about the audio quality than I do about whether or not I sweat a little bit. (laughs) If anything, it kind of gets me in the moment, you know, fully embodied and, you know, ready to slice and dice up the Confederation's message into bite-sized nuggets for the listener. Okay. Well, if you're, I won't comment then if you're glistening, I'll know it's not like a health issue, but it's just hot where you are. It's it's probably (laughs) definitely still a health issue, but you know. (laughs) Okay. Noted. (laughs) (laughs) Well, I'm looking forward to today um, because last week we started to get into this session uh, where Kuo was the source. This was from May 7th, 2000. And the question at hand is essentially, how do our emotions aid in our spiritual development? And we started rolling through the session, and I was politely interrupted by my son, (laughs) and uh, we had to cut it off. But um, I'm looking forward to it because what we're about to get into, I think, are some really cool insights, some really good gems about the nature of emotions and what Kuo calls purified emotion. Um, do you want to do you want to give a recap, or would you like me to, as to what we've covered so far in this session? Uh, I don't feel strongly, but I'm happy to do so. But I'm also happy to let you. I I have a few notes that I took that I thought might uh, help. That's why I don't just do it. Um, all right. So uh, the question, like uh, Ryan said, it's all about emotions and referencing the fact that Quo uh, described emotions as uh, the thinking of the deep mind. Uh, so right off the bat and and heads up to the listener warning, we're probably going to deal with some archetypal mind concepts. I thought about it. It's probably good to just jump right in the way that we always just jump right in. We don't give you the 101, you know, curriculum. We just kind of talk like you already know all this stuff. And I think that uh, that works really well. Maybe it doesn't. And, you know, we, we have a feedback form. Use it uh, liberally. Yeah. Because we love hearing that, you know, anybody's listening to this whatsoever, even if they hate it. Mm-hmm. Uh, so 
where they, they, they give a big exposition <laughs> to get to the point of talking about emotions. And one of them has to do with the irresistibleness of evolution, the way that it is inevitable that we will progress on our path, that there is no stopping. There is no, it's kind of like what A Course in Miracles says in its introduction. It says, you know, this is A Course in Miracles. Uh, it is a required course. Mm. Only the time that you choose to take it in is your choice, you know? Yeah. Uh, so this progress is uh, that we're drawn to seems to inevitably expose us to more negative catalyst than positive catalyst, more negative, hurtful, difficult emotions than the joyous ones. And so a lot of where we have gotten to date is trying to figure out what the function of these emotions are, given that they cause us so much pain, uh, uh, net pain, right? Mm -hmm. Uh, I also think that there is uh, a lot of hints in here about the role that emotions play in uh, how we uh, manifest. I I, kind of have this, uh, this, this hobby horse right now of the manifestation of spirit through mind into body that this is kind of like the way that uh our our progress happens that our function essentially is to the purest extent possible to manifest the the perfection of spirit in the imperfection of the manifest world so i that's i kind of look at things through this perspective and i see a lot to recommend this perspective in here first well not first first and last comment that's a Nice insight, Jeremy. Just the idea of the goal being the manifestation of spirit through mind to body. That is, uh, that's that's a good one. That's I a bet good one. somebody could. I bet somebody could pick it apart and find uh, a way in which I've, I'm neglecting some aspect of the philosophy. And I actually like the first time I was exposed to this uh, concept was in. Um, a uh, channel work called Fatima, Fatima, Fatima mm-hmm. prophecy. I always mess that up uh, by Ray Stanford, who was a channel in the tradition of more of an Edgar Casey in the seventies, okay. uh, but talking about the symbolic analysis of the Fatima miracles. God, I hope I'm saying that right. Uh, and how it really was my first good introduction to the, to the kind of thinking the, the relational finding correspondences, that kind of thinking that comes from a subjective interpretation of metaphor and symbol and how these things can relate to each other and specifically what some of those might be in the Christian faith, because these mm. are, you know, although funnily it, it took place, the, this Christian miracle took place in a town named after, um, I think one of Muhammad's daughters. So there's an interesting <laughs> correlation to the, to the Muslim faith there. Mm. Uh, but, uh, oh, where was I going? Yeah. They, they basically talk about how, uh, the, the cross itself is designed to indicate uh, a cross right at the, uh, if you think, if you superimpose the cross on the human body, where it intersects is at the throat chakra, which they say is the will, the seat of the will, according to their, I, I might not agree with that, but like the way that they tell this story, uh, that it's about surrender and it's about, um, a symbolism between, uh, man, woman, and child, the father, the Holy okay. ghost and the son of, you know, the father of spirit, uh, the, the archetypally uh, masculine represents spirit. The archetypally feminine represents mind. And the archetypal son is the manifestation in the matter. So Interesting. when mind fully opens itself up to spirit and makes itself vulnerable through this open heart, it allows for spirit to come down and manifest most completely. Now, I am not... <laughs> I'm not saying that that is a uh, uh, law of one doctrine there or, mm. or, or dogma. Uh, but I, I, I want to admit to the listener up front that this is a model through which I see a lot of usefulness. So if you want to filter that out, I get that. But the fact that they talk about emotions stemming from um like like the poignancy and the deep resonance of events that happen in our lives that do trigger us 
in that there's a there's an aspect of spirit that plays into that. Um, uh, so remember that line. Um, you see, as the spirit awakens, this process of spiritual and mental evolution. Oh, sorry, <laughs> having your problem. As the spirit <laughs> awakens, this process of spiritual and mental evolution begins to accelerate. The spirit awakening, they've already said, is tied to the emotions and the intensity of these, these mm-hmm. emotions. Whereas before awakening, you were content to skate upon the surface of life as though it were a pond. And this is close to what they're describing as the, as the way of wisdom, right? This detachment from the emotions, not a blocking of them, but a detachment from fully identifying and having all your skin in the game. Mm. Um, once you have awakened, you are aware of and drawn to the depths of each present moment. The profundities, implications, resonances, and overtones of each present moment are infinite. The learning in each present moment is potentially infinite. The gateway to intelligent infinity lies within each present moment. As the spirit awakens, it becomes gradually more able to hear the far more complex symphony of messages that are coming in within each present moment. And where would the messages be coming from? Where would this inspiration be coming from? Mm -hmm. Where would this deep resonant well of information be coming from from the absolute from the spirit this is this to me is saying that the emotions are the keys of the spirit and there's also um clues in here that are talking about the emotions being uh, a key to understanding catalyst i i can't decide if they're implying that emotions are part of the experience archetype that relates to catalyst um but let's put that aside because yeah, <laughs> I'm getting way over my head already. <laughs> Sorry, I should have just started my notes. <laughs> That's the part right. we haven't. But anyway, uh, so so the, this all of this crushing weight of experience, as they call it, uh, seems to be what they say too chaotic to be useful, right? And so we try to stabilize it with logic. We try to rationalize it and understand it analytically. And uh, because this is because, what, because Quo says that e- there is no one in third density. It is designed to the to the point that you will never ever see the perfection of yourself or any other human being. Right, it's designed that way, and you're gonna struggle. Not what they said, whatever. Not today, not every day, but you know, not three times, five times, but seven times and seven times seven. You're it's gonna be a struggle. That's third density, and how do you? How do you learn? How do you deal with that struggle? You know, um, and then Quo discusses, well, you could use these Buddhism, Taoism, the yogic tradition uh, to you can use those tools which help you to move into the blue ray and the indigo ray to intellectualize some of these, you know, some of these issues and challenges. But I think Quo is about to get into some interesting notes about why it may be really important to stay in the heart chakra in the green ray energy center. Absolutely. They talk about the, on the way of wisdom, uh, it, utilizing the intellect and the faculties of reason and logic, and becoming able to distance mm-hmm. the self from those things which are occurring to it and which it is feeling. It's not that they're blocking things. It's like they're not fully dipping their toe into it in the first place. So mm-hmm. whether it's good or bad, it's not really having an effect. Um, and then they, they contrast that with uh, the way of the open heart, uh, which kind of meets emotions head on and utilizes what they, they, they often or elsewhere in this. They say that the emotions have a lot of power. And I think yes. what they're saying is that you're utilizing this power. You are being shaped by it. And by being shaped by it, you are learning about it. Because I believe that in fourth density, this is my opinion, but in fourth density, that's the power we're going to use to be able to interact and manifest in a denser energetic environment of fourth density. Mm -hmm. Quote in the in the paragraph that we left off with in the last episode, quote notes, while it is good to do work in the consciousness in this manner, in other way, in other words, in the blue ray energy center uh, and the indigo ray, it is also somewhat imbalanced because there is no encouragement of the flow of energy through the system, but rather the holding of energy in the higher chakras. Conversely, when one is working in the way of the open heart, one is constantly faced with the entire spectrum of self, uh, self 
from the lowest and most primitive emotion, the desire for survival, the desire for sexual reproduction, the desire for food and safety, upwards throughout the system, touching all of the energy centers, rising as high as indigo ray, but again and again springboarding from the heart. So that instead of the seeker moving into and maintaining as a steady state reliance on the higher chakras, the seeker in the way of love has released the preference for work in the higher energy centers and has accepted the self as a full energy system and reconfigured the goal from staying in the higher energies to accelerating the flow of energy throughout the entire system. Instead of a safe but somewhat turgid and slow-moving path of energy refinement, the brother and sister of the open heart are attempting to take the whole self as it is, and through blind faith alone, and the processes of self-acceptance and self-forgiveness, blessing, forgiving, redeeming, transforming, and offering each and every emotion and sensation to the one infinite creator. So, to me, it sounds like Kuo was really encouraging people to stay in that heart center or at least recognize that it is through that heart chakra in the green ray energy center, as they say, it, it springboards from there. And you have access to a different level of experience than when you simply try to stay in the higher chakras and intellectualize it and, you know, understand it intellectually. It's very strange in a way, because what they're saying is take the less comfortable path and take our word for it. Yeah, we promise it'll work. <laughs> because we're not going to benefit our ego selves, the, the, the self that wants comfort and security and uh, stability. It's not necessarily, I'm not saying that it's going to ruin your life, but it's not necessarily going to select experiences for that. I think it's an interesting idea that if at the principal level, the purpose of existence is the creator wanting to know more of itself. And tell me, friends, what is it that you know about a situation when you only know the situation intellectually versus when you yourself may have gone through a same scenario that your friend who just lost their dad, just lost their dog. Maybe they got fired from the job they were at for 25 years. You can relate differently when you feel what they feel, maybe because you've gone through it yourself or maybe because you're super empathetic. I'm not sure, but the experiencing of those emotions, I would imagine, and I'm just guessing here is simple me. I would imagine that the feelings that come along with those experiences, no, let's be real. The feelings that come along with those experiences are much larger than the pure intellectualization of those experiences. So I could, I can understand why there may be encouragement to embracing, embracing those struggles and those challenges. Let that energy flow through your body, through all of the energy race centers, because there's so much there, you know, there's so much there. And I think you may have, maybe, maybe I'm making this up. I thought you brought this up in the last session about what is it possibly that we could teach the creator, you know, the one yeah. infinite creator. Well, it's all those emotions and responses that we feel day to day. Those are, those are real. The, the struggle is real. When we detach from those, we're just having an experience that's closer to what the creator already has, right? Like we're not oh, adding anything. Correct. Correct. Yes. The, you could think of maybe the creator of being that pure intellectual. And it's like, hey, I want to experience this. Let me you know, split into an infinite number of parts and let all my parts e experience what it is. And, and we're just telling, we're just using this, um, uh, anthropomorphization of course. for effect. It doesn't mean that this is exactly how we think the creator no, is. White this is dude, just white beard. It's a dude, <laughs> white beard. I'm pretty sure he's on a cloud. Okay. <laughs> this has never come up before. So I'm finding out for this, this for the first time listeners. No, but it is a, it is an interesting concept that, uh, yeah, it's, um, I actually uh, I was listening to a, a, a near-death experience interview earlier earlier this week, and um, 
one of my favorite YouTube channels, old Trisha Barker, was uh, uh, interviewing this Israeli woman who died on the operating table. And um, she kind of asked that question when she was dead. What is the what's the purpose of all this suffering? And, you know, and the answer she got back you know, in simple terms was that by by suffering, we can understand the suffering of others and we can better relate to and help and empathize and serve others because we understand what they are going through. And I think that in and of itself is a powerful idea because if you talk with someone, think, think for example, Alcoholics Anonymous. Um, I only have experience of Alcoholics Anonymous through uh, Stephen King interviews. (laughs) Okay. So, uh, but from what I understand is that when you're when you're going through that process, the success rate of really kicking alcoholism is is really only assured when you start helping someone else. You got to go through the process of kicking it. You go to your sponsor, they help you. But if you're really going to stick with it, you have to then pass the torch. You've got to be that sponsor for someone else. You have to serve others. So that's just what comes to mind when you got to learning how to relate, suffering, learning how to relate to others, then turning your experience into a way to serve others and help lead them to that same state of acceptance or recovery or whatever it is. Um, it's, it's a hard pill to swallow, but there's so much truth in that. It is so much easier to empathize. My brother just had to put his family dog down. Bernie's mountain dog was nine years old. I'm so sorry. Man, a wonderful dog. Absolutely wonderful family dog. And he told me on our Wednesday cigar night, he told me, man, the next time a friend or a neighbor loses a family pet, he's, he told me I, there's, I can connect with them on a completely different level now that I've gone through it because it was terrible for their, you know, it was just terrible. They basically watched their dog slowly die for a week or two before they finally threw in the towel, you know, um, yeah. but Anyway, uh, I digress a bit, but emotion, baby, don't, don't skip over that green ray. Don't try to intellect. Well, you can, if you want, it's all, you know, everything is as it's meant to be work in those higher energy centers if you want, but realize there's so much value in the, in the green ray and and below. Yeah. I mean, it's going to be hard for you to necessarily imagine what your higher, larger self uh, has as an agenda or what it sees as, uh, more efficient or less efficient. I still have a problem with the idea of efficiency. It just seems like this isn't a scarce universe with respect to experience, but maybe it is. Maybe maybe there's something that I don't understand. Pause because you've, you brought that up. Can you clarify that for the audience? Because I think it's an interesting idea, but what do you mean? The concept of efficiency is a little bit weird when you're talking about spiritual evolution. Well, right here, as Bra does several times in their contact, they talk about which uh, path is faster, which way of living, which philosophy, which way of approaching experience yields faster progress. Well, why does that matter? Because we've got an infinite amount of time to figure it out. Yeah, there's there's no scarcity. So what are we economizing on? Perhaps we're economizing on the amount of suffering we got to go through in third density in order to move levels? Question mark? Maybe, but like it doesn't seem like the creator has shied away from that much. It just seems like weird that maybe, maybe, maybe there's something deep here that I don't understand. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, I I have this. Uh, I'm really attracted to this idea of third density incarnate waking life as instrumental as not for its own purposes, but as a means to a greater purpose, the greater part of myself uh, believes in and, 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 and craves. Uh, but at the end of the day, like, yeah, I, I, I think that that experience, whether it's a painful experience or joyous experience, is just a means. So why would we economize on it? Mm. That's it's just a, it's just a way to get there. It's not the thing that you actually want. And what cost, what price are you paying? Hmm. 
it's a it's a it's an infinite uh we have infinite amount of time like i just don't understand that uh listeners if you have any ideas about this i would love to I mean, i'm sure ryan would too uh we would love to start a conversation about this it's a great bit to chew on why would raw why would anyone discuss the concept of accelerating your growth if the quickness of growth is not necessarily the purpose of you know if the experience in and of itself and the learning and the growth in and of itself is important yeah it's a good thing to stew on certainly is I, and, and let me say like i still would want to take the more efficient route maybe it's really about trying to understand <laughs> that as a deep pure desire of mine maybe it's uh, maybe I'm over intellectualizing it, right? Jeremy, you know, maybe it's because you're a, you're a wanderer and you've got a deep, you know, spirit taste. You know, you know I, what it is to not be here, and maybe I, you're itching I, to get back. I, re- I really had a flash of insight that, like, I I'm not letting the idea take the path of least resistance to my heart. I'm trying to like push it into the 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 constructs that i'm comfortable with and make sense of it and i can't make sense of it in those constructs i have to Mm -hmm. let it i have to sit with it a little bit more so now i have a theme for the next meditation nice uh anyway (laughs) back to this wonderful session (laughs) yeah yeah can i keep reading let me let me keep going perhaps for the next paragraph at least so this is this is the neck the new part. Yes, right? this, this is, is so this is again. this is new. But Kuo, this is continuing the the ending point of Kuo talking about the the free flowing energy through all of the energy systems rather than just staying in the higher se- in the higher uh, centers. Kuo states, "This invigorates, energizes, and enlivens the entire system." It is as if the owner of an automobile began running the engine through its paces in such a way that it began to burn off the carbon from the valves. The way of wisdom collects detritus, shall we say, the carbon on the valves that is not easily dealt with from the way of wisdom. The way of love is a rough and tumble way in comparison but it also is the fast and cleaner way to use the energy system of the body, mind, and spirit. 4. The emotions that are the responses to catalyst are the shadows, symbols, or increasingly as one progresses, the essence of deep and purified rivers of energy that abide within within what your psychologist would call the unconscious mind. I almost want to pause. No, I do kind of want to pause there and just stress that last sentence for the emotions that are the responses to catalyst are the shadows, symbols, and the essence of deep and purified rivers of energy that abide within your what well, in your unconscious mind. It's an interesting little tidbit there what emotions are. They're hints, they're little tastes of that deep energy that's inside of you. And there's certainly a connection to the archetypal station of catalyst here, I can see. Hmm. Uh, it's almost like emotions are the flip side of what we would otherwise call catalyst. It's like they're a, they're a single thing. Well, they're not a single thing. It's a response. But I almost think of it as the emotions are how you recognize the catalyst, right? Yeah. If you didn't have the emotional response, it wouldn't be catalyst. In fact, Roth says that, don't they? <laughs> yeah. Quote quote continues, at the roots of consciousness lie rivers of purified emotion that are as gems, perfectly and regularly refracting from the white light of unlimited energy, the colorations of energy which are called emotion, which express essences which the Creator has previously learned about itself. Hmm. These essences are as great truths into which the seeker taps however imperfectly and however distortedly, as it moves through catalyst and encounters difficulties and meets challenges. Mm, there, this paragraph alone is solid and I think worthy of rereading ten times, but that last sentence, the essences are as great truths. So the energy that you're feeling is a small taste of that pure energy 
Uh, oh, hold on. The emotions that you're feeling are a taste of that pure energy that is running through you. And those are these essences are like great truths into which you can tap, even though you don't always do it quite right, um, as you encounter a catalyst. Right, because these emotions can be tangled up and it's hard to see them as the pure signposts that they might be. Um, and therefore, it makes it hard to see our catalyst purely. Yes. And remember, what our catalyst is, at least in the mind, uh, is the subconscious's ability to create a perception that allows you to have an experience, right? So it, gives, so it, it, is, the, it is the thing that is coloring it is the it is the, the it is the thing that is pointing to uh, what kinds of uh, experience. I, it, see, it's hard to to disentangle catalysts from experience, but they are distinct archetypes. So I want to be careful. Catalyst is the subconscious part of it. Experience is the conscious part. Because catalyst is not something that happens outside of you, right? C catalyst is your interpretation of a situation. Maybe somebody did something, maybe it was an action that someone else did, but it's not that action per se that is the catalyst. It is your reaction to it. It is your emotional response. Your emotional response. <laughs> you tapping into that energy that's flowing in you. And that is what gives it the voltage to be able to work well or not, right? It is. Uh, as that experience is then, you know, uh, as experiences accumulate. And as then yeah. another archetype enters, right, the significator, which seeks to mine that as that process of, of, of matrix potentiator catalyst experience. I see it as kind of going around in a mm. cycle. Okay. We are right on the edge of what I understand with the words yeah. that you just said, just a heads up. L let's make sure it doesn't <laughs> uh, make sure. Let, let's just make sure it doesn't occlude what we're trying to explain. In sure. The the, the, this, the stuff about uh, a catalyst and experience isn't so important to get perfectly right. The point is, is that emotion plays a huge role in going through this, uh, this, this more clear and articulated way of 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 manifesting the creator of manifesting love in our lives yes quo continues each has felt those moments when a tiny thing triggered a massive flood of emotion and when this occurs it is an excellent signal from the self to the self that here is a gift that is imperfectly seen perhaps but that is real that moves into the experience as a done thing, as something that is felt, not created. Emotions are messages from the unconscious or deeper self to the conscious self. I, again, the, this, the, we're already off to a great start on this paragraph. I mean, it, basically what it's saying is that it's the medium by which the catalyst and the experience communicate. That's what I am reading there. The like, medium I, between which the catalyst and the experience communicate. Yeah. Okay. That's good. How, how the subconscious has set up, has biased you prior to the experience to interpret it and perceive it in a certain way. Oh, and then the emotion yes. allows you to then have the experience that then can be like gone back and analyzed with the conscious mind. Right. Mm -hmm. And you can kind of like see where that resonance is. If we're, if we're a, if we're somebody who wants to work with emotions, then we may have the patience to tap into that, but we got to go through the, 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 the physical experience that we had, that emotional like memory that we have of, mm -hmm. of what happened. We have to get down to what it says about us. It is so interesting to think that pre-incarnation, you're essentially metaprogrammed. Your soul or your subconscious is programmed so that you have these emotional responses that you, you know, that could, because one thing that bothers you, Jeremy, might not bother me. And some things that bother me aren't going to bother you. And ain't that funny. And mm -hmm. geez, as a father of a two and a half year old, some things bother my kid that he didn't learn. He just is that way. It's he, he wasn't born a blank slate, you know, oddly enough, yeah. something's in there. So it's interesting to think about, okay, 
he really came in programmed not liking tomato sauce on his pasta. For whatever reason, he has an emotional response to that catalyst, and we got to figure it out. But, I mean, that's a silly, a silly example of a of a what can be very serious. Um, we all interpret events very differently, and it's but it's just an interesting thought that perhaps the reason for that is because at a soul level, we have the lessons we want to learn, the things we want to deal with, and we're some kind we're kind of programmed to have emotional responses to specific occurrences and if it were easy to change the terms of that programming if it was easy to simply change your mind as some new age people like to remind us uh breathlessly all the time uh then it it would be like the programming wouldn't really even matter like it wouldn't have the weight that it does it's precisely designed uh to do what we're recognizing and, and disliking. Mm-hmm. <laughs> That's why I say that it it may be a way of detaching from things, but I like this idea of the of me as an instrument. Me as recognizing that when you beat the hammer against the nail, it doesn't mean that there's something wrong with the hammer, that it's coming into conflict, right? Mm-hmm. It just means that that's what the hammer does. And the more that you can accept that, it's not really about a distancing from it. It's about recognizing that there's nothing wrong when you feel these harsh emotions. And later on, they talk about how the path is largely about becoming more and more vulnerable to these emotions, not not distancing yourself from them, but feeling them more and more and more and knowing that you can maintain a coherent, true self throughout. Yes. Isn't that. Okay, I don't want to. Okay, we got so much to get through. Let's keep going. But that was, that's so good. Okay, we continue. Now, there are various levels of messages and various layers to emotions. It is not a simple practice to enter into one's emotions and to attempt to come into a deeper understanding of the heart of those emotions. Not simply what triggered the emotion, but what kind of emotion it essentially is. And what challenge it represents. In this, in this wise, it is often helpful to think of the centers of energy within the physical body. For difficult emotions often can be placed within certain energy centers and can be seen as messages expressing to the heart the need for working with those aspects of those emotions which are disturbing in such a way as to be able to balance and clarify those feelings. For there is a deeper truth within each emotion. The key to working on emotions is to realize the seat of emotion, shall we say, as being the green ray energy center or the heart chakra. Uh, again, so that's two long paragraphs in a row that are just rich with ideas. I could probably stew for a month on on these, and uh, it's just fantastic. Yeah, the the one thing that I would say, because I think it's pretty clear, but um, because they provide such a, a an approachable map to our emotional experience. And the way that it relates to all these other concepts, like the energy centers and stuff like that, it's easy to think, yeah, I can sort of trace all of this together and understand uh, the concept that they're talking about. And you very well may. But the way to use their uh, message to the fullest is to try to feel what they're saying. Yeah. To take this in the meditation and to feel what they're saying so that you don't have to rely on just seeing perfectly in every situation. If you could rely upon yourself to perceive everything clearly, you could perhaps reason towards the right outcome every time, but give up on that. We're not designed to perceive. That is not the design of third density. And so we have to build the ability to experience our lives on these deeper, more subtle levels that we're not comfortable with, that society that we live in is not comfortable with. Mm Mm-hmm. We continue. If one attempts to work with blocked and negative emotions from the energy in which they originate, without moving into the heart chakra, there is little chance or opportunity for self-forgiveness. Therefore, 
While it is very important to assess and evaluate each negative emotions as probably stemming from certain energy centers, it is well to model the working with these essential and energetic nexi, which are emotions, with the model of keeping the energy in flow, moving again and again into the heart chakra and resting in that primary emotion, which is called faith. I didn't pick up on it the first million times I read it that they're basically saying that faith is a kind of primary emotion here. Does that perhaps broaden the, de- the, the, the concept of what they're talking about when they talk about emotions? Well, it's interesting to think that with, with faith, it, faith is like the ingredient or the mechanism that allows that free flowing of energy, that yeah. trust that this is how it's supposed to be. This is, you know, this is going to work out. This is how I'm going to learn. You know, this is the most efficient way of doing this. Because they talk about moving into the heart chakra and about opportunity. It's not about forcing it into a configure. It's Forgiveness is not necessarily something that you just do as an act of will. It has to be seated and centered in the right way. It has to be deep. It has to connect. And it seems like later on they say that the heart chakra is the seat of deity is one Mm. way of saying it. So there's something very connected with the unified creator of which we are a part. And these emotions that we experience as piecemeal parts of the creator. Mm -hmm. Cool continues. There is a deep well of emotion whose basic goal is to move all entities into unconditional love. It is towards unconditional love that the path of your spiritual evolution is irresistibly moving. This unconditional love is the most universal and powerful emotion and, indeed, is all that there is. In other words, the Logos itself The one great original thought is a purified emotion. It is not a thought precisely. A thought is linear. An emotion is global, universal, round, three-dimensional. It does not climb, it rolls. It does not fall, it continues to roll. Nothing can knock out the force of emotion. Indeed, it is that to which each must come in order to be able to graduate into the density of love, which is your next experience. Mm, that's a tall order, Quo. <laughs> you got to move into that energy center if you want to graduate. Yeah, but once you, but once you move into that energy center, nothing, nothing can stop you. Nothing can knock out the force of emotion. You have to be able to uh, come into some sort of relationship with this to move in the fourth density. Mm. It seems so worth it if you put in the work. It's also interesting to, to notice that uh, they started all of this out saying life is energy and progress is an inevitable Jeremy, uh, they start this out saying life is really hard. Yeah, oh, that's true. Uh, <laughs> not to contradict point. you, but they no, they no, no, you're right, saying you're this right. sucks. But but it feels like a year ago when they said life is energy. So sorry. <laughs> <laughs> um, but uh, when they talk about this inevitable progress, it's towards love that we're progressing. Mm. That is like the gravity pulling us, right? And we and we can either try to speed it up, we can be more aerodynamic or something, or we can try to apply the brakes as the service to self path does, right? Yeah. yeah. Again, Quo continues, consequently, it is simply more efficient, there it is, mm-hmm. to choose the way of the heart, in our opinion, and to see the goal of working with difficulty, not in achieving happiness peace, or content, but rather simply in continuing to accelerate the pace of spiritual and mental evolution. The energy of the open heart is open-ended. It does not attach an outcome. 
it simply seeks greater openness of self and a greater ability to allow these rising emotions to do the work of the refiner's fire. The seeker who has faith in the way of love has faith that no matter what comes, she will be able to survive it. That no matter how much various difficulties cause suffering and pain, she will be able to use those difficulties to refine those rivers of emotion that are rising to consciousness. It is a bumpier and rougher ride to seek the way of the open heart than to seek the way of wisdom. It is a way which invokes faith without proof, reason, or logic. There is no attempt to justify hardship, but neither is there the attempt to disempower hardship by rising above it. Rather, the way of the open heart is the way of vulnerability and remaining open and weak in the face of strong and sometimes painful feelings. And yet, because it sees the whole of imperfect selfhood as a beautiful and perfect thing in all its paradox, it is the wiser path for your density. There is time enough to learn wisdom once you have learned to love fearlessly to meet each moment with an open and unguarded heart. Hmm. Oh, I'm trying to key in here on... Uh, there was it, a lot of ground covered there. I like... I like one of these last lines. No, the last line. There is time enough to learn wisdom once you have learned to love fearlessly. Yeah, it puts it in the right perspective, right? Like, it does. It's, we're not saying wisdom is bad, right? There's not, it's not a war between wisdom and the heart. Um, it is uh, a matter of sequence. That's all. And perhaps efficiency in, uh, yeah. <laughs> in this density. Yeah. I mean, I just, I think, I think the chakra system lays out the sequence, right? More yeah. Generally. The interesting thing is that they talk about, um, maybe they don't talk about in this reading, but they talk about in other ones about how you work with each of these and you, you find, you locate your blockages at each of the energy centers and you scan them for like when emotions come up and all that. And you try to understand them on these seven terms, right? But at the end of the day, you're bringing it back to the heart to be redeemed. You're bringing it back to the heart to be seated. And I believe it is that path of bringing it back to the heart, wherever it originated, so that it can be forgiven and that you can be forgiven and that the full weight of it can be balanced. This would also be the place where the balancing exercises take place, I believe. That as you understand these experiences and you, in meditation, accentuate a difficult experience in your mind until it's intolerable, and then you accentuate it until it is the most perfect and beautiful thing ever, then it is only that that can only be done in the heart, that kind of imagination, that kind of uh, regard for the value of the experience above and beyond how much it's hurting you. That's where the forgiveness begins, I believe. And that's where the creator that is giving the creator everything that it craves. That's giving it the full weight of that experience, not as a, blue version of the experience, but as full color. The balancing exercise. I think this is the, this is not the first time I've heard of the balancing exercise. Can we cover really quickly what this is? Yeah. And maybe it, even it, give an example. Sure. Uh, this, this is in the raw contact. So, uh, I'm only going to deviate from that. I'm sorry. Uh, but my sense to give you the gist is that, uh, when we deal with difficult experiences in real life, we can't always react in the way that we would like respond in the way that we like, and we can feel guilty about that, or we can stew on it, or we can take it into meditation and offer it to the creator. And the way that we offer it to the creator in the purest form so that we don't have to like get caught up in it all the time is we use our imagination, our mind and meditation. We imagine the feeling that that generates and we intensify that feeling because we're usually balancing emotions that are negative. Mm -hmm. I suppose you can balance positive emotions, but 
they don't seem to need so much work. But the negative emotions, you intensify that emotion in your mind imaginatively until it is the the epitome of the emotion, right? That if you're feeling anger at somebody, you intensify the anger until you want to wring their neck and you want to stamp their name out of history like the most the most extreme thing that you can think of. When you do that, uh, those of Ra and those of Quo have said in the past that they guarantee us generally that, <laughs> that the opposite emotion will naturally come up as you invest in that polarized version of that motion. Mm. And as you allow yourself to swing the pendulum to swing in the other direction fully, because you've pulled it back fully, right? Ah. So now it, it is natural for the mind and the way that emotions work, according to the Confederation, that its opposite will manifest in order to give the creator what the real, what the illusion is designed to give the creator. Mm. The illusion isn't designed for us. It's designed for the creator to have the deepest, richest experience possible based on what it has learned from the other octaves of experience to date. So you allow and you intensify that the exact opposite of the emotion you were just feeling. And if it was anger, you feel the most loving acceptance. You feel yourself meld into the other person. I'm just giving like examples of like what you might, how you might use visualization, how you might use the imagination to create this emotional experience. And then once you have experienced both uh, intense poles of this emotion, you bless it and accept it and accept yourself for having both emotions, not just the one. It is a full experience. It is not simply something that came at you that had this, you know, a weird valence to it. It You now understand it as a full uh, 360 degree experience within a creation that has 360 mm. degrees. And that allows for it to be harvested by the creator in some way that I think is very mysterious. But it is interesting in here that I think what Quo is 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 hinting at is that it's through the heart that that happens. It is in the yeah. heart that the creator takes possession of this. Yeah. And there's some sort of like mysterious way in which this makes the experience like you net like it, it takes some of the bite out of it because yeah. you understand it. This is a uh, that that is very helpful and very insightful. Um, and I think is a very good exercise. And I would say, I feel like I'm starting to do this exercise almost nat naturally or just kind of uh, organically. And one example is this car prowler that we have in our neighborhood that will come through and look through cars and rummage through things. Friends, don't judge me. I got dark really quick on the things I wanted to do to this guy. I just, I just, something about the concept of stealing really bothers me. Probably because when I was really young, I was a klepto. I, I stole money, money from my stepmom and it about ruined our relationship. So I've probably still got issues I'm working through on that, but it was terrible. So, um, <laughs> just there illustrated what we're talking about in that balancing. Didn't yeah. You? I mean, well, it's, it's my own guilt that I feel like I'm still, I, I just know how much I hurt my stepmom when I was being a dumb 10 year old or whatever I was. And and now whenever I see people stealing, I'm like, dude, do you have, do you have no idea what you're doing to other people? Anyway, this car prowler, right? In my head, I got dark real fast. I was going to wait up at night, you know, I'll, in my camo, in the bushes, whatever, you know. Um, and, you know, very quickly, though, very quickly, I do, I start taking it to the extreme. It's like, okay, right. But I take it past a point that I know I would ever do. You know, it's like, okay, let's get, let's get explicit here for a minute. Okay. The guy, I'm going to, I'm going to hide in the bushes. Okay. I'm going to see him come up. Here's where it diverts from real Ryan to like pretend balancing exercise Ryan. But my mind still goes here. It's like, okay, I'm going to come up. You know, I know jujitsu. I'm going to come up and choke him out. You know, I don't know. I'll, uh, I'll brand him. I don't know, you know, but you can, you can keep taking it further and further and you can start to see it or explore this side of yourself that does not exist, but those thoughts are there. You can create those thoughts in your mind. And if thoughts are real things, you can kind of create these experiences and you can forgive me for keeping going this, but you can, I will take it to the extreme 
almost to the to to try to find at what point I'm not myself. You know, at what point am I really making things up that I know I would never, ever, ever do that because it's too evil, it's too dark. And I, it doesn't take me long to get there. But at the same time, as soon as I start moving in that direction, Jeremy, and I like the way you described it, I feel an inevitable pull back to the other side. And I start thinking, okay, well, if I jumped out at this guy, maybe instead what I would do is like, hey, man, what are you doing? What's going on? Are you okay? D- what's going on in your life? I, are you are you broke? Do you have a family? Maybe this is just a weird choice he made, but I start pulling that other direction. Hey, he's probably got, what if he's got kids? You know, what if that's, that's the best way I can put it. I start running through these scenarios in my head and they take me way off the one end. That's just crazy. And then way off to the other end that is also probably equally crazy, you know, but, and then I come, I always come back to right where I am right in the middle. But, um, it's, I'm glad you explained that because I can, I can relate to that. Well, next time you are in a situation like that, try taking it into meditation. Mm. If you weren't already taking the meditation, because I know what you're talking about. Um, it, and, and it's almost like an emotional component to the, to the chewing of an idea or a desire in the mind. Um, but when it's taken in the meditation, what happens is, that you are able, and this is what I think part of the balancing exercise is about, is that you're able to separate in a way, filter out the emotion from the experience, from the actual proximate cause. Hmm. And as you're able to intensify the emotion on its own terms, using the visualization as a way to get the emotion. But remember, the emotion is what you want, not the, uh, the creative ways to uh, mess with this guy, right? Like, yeah. that's just a means to the end. And in meditation, mm. with the proper concentration, you can focus on that emotion. And then you will find that the, that the, the, the swing back will be even more intense. And what you're able to do by focusing on the emotion purely I have found really seats things in a way like you really get the gist of it. Again, Jeremy, this is why I love talking with you because you make me realize so many things. I don't, so I don't take it into meditation, but it is, I guess it is that emotion that I feel, but maybe I'm not taking it far enough because I very quickly go from anger, you know, I'm like anger. And then I start feeling pain for like, or sadness for, you know, for this other, yeah, for this guy, that, you know? Yeah, that that's normal. Like all, all I'm saying is that, uh, uh, it's something you can do every day. It doesn't have to be a response to a difficult thing mm. at the end of the day meditation. Uh, think about your day and think about anything that caused blockages that caused catalyst, uh, and, uh, index it, acknowledge it, right? Like you're, you're indexing it in your mind by, by thinking on it, allow it to intensify, allow its opposite to intensify, accept yourself, anything else in your day, do the same. And as you practice this, I believe, uh, it will become more natural, uh, to seek meditation as a way to do this balancing instead of doing what we do is we do it in the, in the, in the world of the moment. Mm -hmm. I don't think the balancing is designed to be done in the world of the moment because we need to be in that moment, Mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. We can't be like reflecting. And those, those of Quo often point out that they, they, they suggest taking the, taking, getting some distance from the thing and, and meditate on how you really feel because it's the it's what sticks with you that needs to be worked with Mm -hmm. what happens in the moment might might just a lot of it might not even connect because it's so outrageous or visceral or it's just getting your attention in this way that isn't really useful because you're an animal and Mm -hmm. you're responding to stimuli yeah but if you take it into meditation you allow for your deeper self to work with it and you may get more clues i guess that's another way of saying what i'm saying noted yeah that was good Okay, so let's continue. So this next paragraph, just to remind you of the, you know, what we're finishing up with, Quo, just, he just said, or Quo just said, there is time enough to learn wisdom once you've learned to love fearlessly. Quo continues, this entity, i.e. Carla, has experienced two pure emotions that it continuously knows of, grief and love. Neither experience shall ever be forgotten. 
When the seeker touches the heart of an emotion and it resonates purely, it is a life-changing event. Never again will grief lay waste to this instrument as it did before it experienced pure grief. And we might say that this is so for each shade of emotion, each tributary of each river of purified essence. That's, again, very good. Once you get hit with pure emotion, experiencing small tributaries of that pure river is not going to affect you the same way. No. Do you have any yeah. thoughts on that? Not really. I, I think they're just saying it's kind of a just so story from the Confederation, right? This is how it is. Hmm. Uh, it's up to us to see if our experience bears that out or not. Hmm. And like I, the, the thing is, is that like, I think a lot of our modern comfortable lives uh, don't provide a lot as many opportunities for these uh Eh, I don't really think I believe that even. <laughs> Maybe cut that out. <laughs> sure. Or leave it in if you really want to <laughs> needle me. We've only got two paragraphs left in the session before it gets into the question and answer. Okay, um, good, 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 good. Let's good. hammer through this. All right. When each of you staggers under the load of difficult emotion, we can only ask you to think on what you basically believe to be true about your incarnational experience. If you believe that your life makes sense, and this we truly believe is so, then you are able to see that each difficult emotion is a gift from the self to the self of the truth of what that self is processing at the moment and of its relationship to the deeper truths within. If the seeker can believe that the life makes sense, then there is that faith which can be called upon, that faith that says, my life does make sense. These difficulties have a reason for being there. They are my way of learning past this moment. Then, the seeker has reason to work with these challenging and difficult feelings to allow and even to encourage their movement through the energy system. It may help, as it does this instrument, to think of the heart as a seat which contains deity, so that there is, in emotions brought to the heart, a place where they can be laid and given away to the one infinite creator. For many times, emotions are overpowering, and there is literally no way to do anything with them except to offer them up. But if they are offered up in faith, this too is working with emotions in the heart center and is part of work well done. I wonder if there's a connection between this concept we investigated in a past uh, Kuo channeling of talking about the heart putting out a lot of garbage and this concept of offering up to the creator. I don't like the uh, metaphor of putting our emotional garbage out in a can for the creator to rummage through. <laughs> like, but um, I'm, I'm trying to think uh, laterally here mm. and see associations where they pop out to me as you uh, very ably read this. Um, mm. I, I also think... Sorry, go ahead. Well, I was just was thinking. I very much enjoy again the the reiteration of faith. That you have faith that your life makes sense. Then you are able to see e each difficult emotion is a gift from they say from the self to the self. Look, it's a gift from you to you about your experience and growth. That's, but that can't be the case if it's wrong. Yes. And it is the wrongness with which we perceive these, these catalytic uh, uh, things that makes us feel like we're not, we don't, our life doesn't make sense, right? It's what makes us think that our life doesn't make sense. And so 
what is the seeker's path, but just trusting that no matter how bizarre, how sorrowful things get, that this is part of what you wanted to learn. Hmm. And that, you know, there's another, there's another quote where, where they discuss faith and they say, faith is to a certain extent, a uh, fake it till you make it kind of thing. Amen. <laughs> If you relate. believe that your life makes sense, um, that means that you have put will into manifesting that belief. Mm. Does anybody really think that they're ever going to be proven by phenomenal reality, by waking life, that their life makes sense in some way that they'll be able to be confirmed by other people? No, I don't. Yeah, no, I, I don't. Do need, I've long since given up. I wake up every morning with faith <laughs> that the day is going to play out, the week is going to play out. And I'm not, I don't, you know, I don't ascribe to say like Sam Harris's view of, you know, the kind of the lack of free will via our kind of pre-programming or whatever. I do wake up the feeling I have a choice every day to make, but I do, I do enjoy the challenges that come in day to day because, and we've discussed this before because I like what comes on the other side of that challenge that feeling of growth and the, the free will thing is kind of an interesting, uh, thing to drill into a little bit. Um, so, uh, if I understand Ra's message, those of Ra's message, uh, about free will and it's reality, uh, versus whether everything's just preordained, um, they, they kind of like try to obliquely <laughs> elide the question completely. Mm -hmm. Cause, and I think it's because they don't, it doesn't really capture what's going on. The free will is a story we tell ourselves to relate to our lives in a particular way. If we did not tell ourselves the story, we would not be able to experience life in the certain way that we do. Just like if we didn't believe that you drive on the right side of the road, it, we wouldn't be able to work, right? Like it's all of our shared belief in that. And so if you look at belief as less of this modern scientific thing of, I believe things that have been proven, hmm. um, and look at it more as like these creative, it's a creative artistic act that you take to shape your life, to tell the creator something. And that that belief is not something that is the result of a process of validating every, all the facts of your life. It is instead something that you creatively as an act of will, hopefully as an act of love um, and curiosity, like a, an appreciation for how wonderfully novel <laughs> the create that this, the creator's universe is. If you can use belief as a creative way to, to assert who you truly are in your deepest sense, um, let me pause because this is the idea I wanted to spit out. And then I said, no, no, let's keep pushing because you, and forgive me for paraphrasing, I'll try to stitch it together. The whole point of experiencing these emotions, whether negative or positive, whatever they may be, and, what, and letting that energy flow all the while being you and being comfortable being you, your true self. And I love that idea that, yes, on the one side, we have all these challenges and experiences and emotions that we're trying to learn from, but at its core, you know, can you be you? Are you comfortable being you? Are you secure in being you? And, so, and oftentimes it feels like, well, and then going back to your previous idea, the mind manifesting or the spirit manifesting itself through the mind to the body it's like deep down we all feel like we are something Th that i am me sometimes my mind is a block to that maybe i'm misperceiving things maybe i'm uncomfortable with things and whatever is blocking whatever my mind is blocking surely can't manifest into my daily actions and daily decisions so it's like i just love for me, it all kind of ties together of experiencing these emotions, let it flow. And with that, with that core concept of being you at the, yeah. at the spirit level, as it manifests through your mind to your body. 
The funny thing is that even self-loathing is an acknowledgement of the reality of the self and the primacy of the self, right? Yes. Like it is, it is, um, it, our, our experience, our con- consciousness is basic. Consciousness is a basic thing in the universe. It is the medium for everything. And, um, when we believe we are creative, that is the thing that I really want to say is that we need to recognize that this belief comes from reaching very deep within ourselves and making what we believe is true. What makes us us is that belief in the true principles that we hold dear and letting our actions, letting our words, letting the energy we radiate all reflect that sense of self. And then once we can accept ourselves as doing that, we can accept others. And once we have the patience to find that within ourselves and to let ourselves go through a process that may be dark to find that, we can allow others to be dark because they're going through their process. It doesn't threaten us. It is part of us waking up that they wake up. Our paths are connected And one of the beautiful things about third density, I think, is how how much incarnation, all of these beautiful, perfect, you know, uh, souls who can see how much uh, how much more is to come, but come here and forget all everything so that they can uh, experience this not alone. (laughs) They're not doing it alone. They're doing it with each other. We're all on this. Yeah. What a great session. I would encourage yeah. everyone to read this and even the question and answer, you know, past this, you know, the question and answers are always, always fun to read, but what a great session. And again, one thing I just love about these messages is the empowering nature of the philosophy and the templates they provide, the mental templates they provide to help sort through whatever issues you might be dealing with. Um, I just love it. So I certainly encourage you all, you know, read this transcript, take what resonates with you. You know, as Jeremy said, as he's, you know, as you are looking at things from that, uh, that current perspective of, of spirit, mind, and body, it's what I love so much about all of this is that I'm coming from a different place than you. So I get little tidbits out of this than what you Mm -hmm. get. So it's all, it's like a personalized lesson for you. For for everyone that comes in, it's like your own personalized little lesson because everyone's got different lenses through which they're reading these messages or listening to these messages. And yet, we have enough that we can have a coherent conversation. I hope. This, you know what I mean, like it true. seems like we do. Yeah. Um, and I would also uh, say that there are some gems in the question and answers related to this. Did session. you want to? Do you want to cover any, or do you want to leave those I, as, I, as I'd Easter like to eggs? highlight some? I think they should go read them themselves. I don't want to spend any more time, you know, okay. just reading off a paper or a computer screen. But um, uh, when Jim is channeling Quo, they make a point of emphasizing that uh, it is the use of catalyst that is the variable which offers to each entity more or less of the opportunity to realize the perfection and love contained in each moment. This is uh, in the context of just understanding what we're supposed to be accomplishing when we're doing it right in terms of dealing with catalyst Mm -hmm. is that it's supposed to be waking us up to the love in the moment and it's doing it in this very dissonant way. Yes. But that's because we've brought that dissonance to the situation. But good way of putting it because when you're having a fight with someone, a verbal argument with whomever in the moment, you're not thinking, Oh boy, I wonder if I can find the love in this situation. (laughs) That's stuff that you've got to sort through like post occurrence, post fight. And then maybe the next time you get into that situation, maybe you deal with it a little bit differently because you start to, you know, you start to see that person a little bit differently. You, you can condition yourself to, uh, in fact, I think that's a lot of what um, what uh, spiritual discipline is about. The discipline part is making sure that you can that you can respond to events that you're not simply reacting. 
Mm. When you can respond, then you're coming from a place where this is your, this is you as you are, uh, uh, intersecting with that wave that is the experience, the, the, the catalysis or whatever. Um, and that is telling you something about yourself. Mm. That's the important point is that it's not out there. Yes. It's not out there. It's not out there. Thank you for reiterating that. It's not out there. That uh, that alone, if you can learn that lesson outside of spirituality. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> that is a powerful lesson. If you learn that it is not what happens to you that matters, it's your reactions to what you think happens to you that creates reality. That is powerful. Yeah. That is powerful. And so I think that the adept <laughs> or people who are on the adept's path are ones who are uh, adept at seeing uh, the events in their lives for the catalyst that they are. Mm. They're seeing, they're, they're, they have a better connection with the subconscious through the material of their life, mm -hmm. not as some sort of like uh, sidebar to their normal life. You mm -hmm. see what I mean? I do. But I also it's like the main event. I like the way that you put it when you said, if you can respond rather than react, because that, yeah. it, that those, those words imply that you are present in the moment mm -hmm. and you don't, it's like you can feel and acknowledge the emotions that are coming through you, but you're not stopping them and trying to deal with them right there. No, and not only that, but you are looking for opportunities. And it's funny that they describe it that way. They almost describe it as a crapshoot. But it's like you get these little moments where the stars align and a lot of progress can be made in a short amount of time. Yeah. These quanta, these leaps, right? Yeah. Uh, so, but you have to be, you have to have the discipline of having worked with yourself enough times that you, when you have an emotional reaction, you don't have the immediate, this is wrong. So I have to do something about it. I have to react. Yes. No, this is telling me something. I should pay attention and stay alert. Yes. Different, completely different mentality. It's, it's, it's just so amazing how uh, perfect we can make it look by talking about it. And in the moment, it seems like, oh, it's so hard. <laughs> it's it has so us, hard. It, it has us by the balls, man. It like, does. It, it, it yeah. always does because it knows exactly where to push. Um, there was another thing that they put in there about the untangling process. And I covered that earlier, that a lot of what purified emotions are, are emotions so fully processed that we've untangled the different strains that occur in them. Mm. And that that is a big part of, uh, well, what do they say? This ability to see the nature of your experience is also the process of untangling these emotions, which are fused together, perhaps in a confusing fashion. So you are able to see, separate anger from jealousy, from disappointment, from doubt, from hilarity, from rage, et cetera, et cetera. Mm -hmm. um, the idea being that it's not about finding different labels, right? It's about understanding these things as pure and pure essences. And that's why I was uh, suggesting that the balancing exercises be understood in part as not simply offering it up to the creator and seeing the intensity of both poles, but also a way to, uh, oh man, I lost my train of thought. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry. It sucks when you're on a roll. It's like you're channeling, Jeremy, and you just got to leave a lot I behind. I just lost and it. <laughs> there was somewhere I was going with that. Mm. Oh man. Well, it's it like, always... I, I do, I do what immediately comes to mind is if you're having a fight, say you're in a, a relationship and, uh, you learn that your girlfriend cheated on you or something mm -hmm. and you might feel immediate. What do you feel there? A whole mess of emotions, yeah. right? And can you, can you split between the anger, the sadness, the love, the, the beach. Can you sort through and pinpoint why and how do you deal with each of those tributaries that lead into that one big river of suck, you know? Because the purer and purer you understand those emotions, the purer and purer you will understand the message from your subconscious. Mm. And mm. the more you can you, you unite those two things. Yes. And gosh, to tie it back, those emotions, 
are messages from your subconscious. And also rivers of, 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 of energy that is the substance of our life. Mm. Like they are uh, concentrations, it seems, of what we deal with right now and on the most mundane basis. Yeah. Um, so, and they also, uh, let's all, let's not forget that one part where they say they represent, uh, lessons the creator learned in past octaves. That's an interesting thing because it's almost like in the same way that the archetypal system represents the creator's or the logos, um, best understanding of its, of, of what it learned about itself in the past octave, whatever that means, right? Mm-hmm. Whatever that means. Mm-hmm. Um, Emotions seem to be another way that we tap in. And I'm interested in the corollaries between purified emotions and the archetypes. There does seem to be a relationship that maybe they're two sides of the same coin, that one is the mind and the other is something else, or maybe they're both part of mind. I don't know. It's something that I'm speculating about. And we are getting way into the frontier of, you know, what I've thought about. Of speculation, (laughs) which I love. I love getting into speculation with you, Jeremy. (laughs) Uh, well that's all i got on this i feel like i have more to say about it but it would revolve around too many repeated concepts and at the end of the day what i have to say doesn't matter that much what if, if if only i can inspire it me and ryan if we can inspire a desire for you yourself to fully engage with this material and we can just be friends of yours instead of I, what I would hate would be people just listening to this and not feeling like there was any interest in reading the material directly, you know, mm. yeah. seeing what other material is out there. I promise you're going to get anyone who reads this or reads any other transcript that we might discuss is going to get something for themselves. You yeah. know, it may not be every exactly. transcript that really connects with you, but every now and then you'll run into one. And it, you'll feel like it was written for you. And that's a powerful, and there's so many of these freaking transcripts. So it's, it's almost a, uh, almost a curse with how many there are to kind of sort through and read. But every now and then you run into one that just really speaks to the moment for what you may be dealing with. And well, for me, yeah, it's been powerful. You, you nailed it. Like, that's what I wanted to say, but I didn't even know it. And, uh, I would only uh, only uh, say otherwise that um, if you're open to transformation, this process, this progress that they talk about, they tie into transformation. This is where we make our leaps. So the more that you are putting your intention and your attention on this path and on the details of it in the way that made sense, makes sense to you. Uh, the more you're going to open yourself up to those opportunities. And that's what it's all about. Not a podcast, not a book, not even channeling. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, I can't wait to uh, get to this session in at this pace six years (laughs) when I get to read this one again. Um, But I love I love the concept. And the very idea that emotions, our emotions are uh, maybe something different than what we, th- what we think they are, or, or at least no matter what we think they are, what is their purpose? You know, what is their purpose and how do we interact with it? I love that the, the ideas that this has given me. So uh, I'm glad you, br- I'm glad you uh, sent this to me and wanted to hash this one out. Absolutely. Uh, a deeper respect for one's emotions was one of the first things that I really feel like I learned when I had my awakening, uh, in 2014, 2015, uh, mm-hmm. just the idea of opening up to them is not a distraction or like a byproduct, but is something that is a first order element of the creation was a huge revelation. And it not only opened up my mental models, but it exposed, it made me pay more attention to, to the, to the, what I feel mm-hmm. and I, I know what they mean. I think when they say, when they talk about untangling emotions, they do, they're so tangled and yeah. all we want is to get them out of the way. And we just keep crumpling them up more and more so we can throw them away and there's nowhere else they go. Yeah. <laughs> I think, uh, I'm just going to 
throw this in. We're not going to dive into this pool. But if this was like a political podcast, we could have a very interesting discussion about the entangled emotions. Um, you know, just with I've noticed with all my all my neighbors who think and feel differently and everyone has such strong feelings about things. And of course, that translates into who you support, what team you're on or who you you know, who you vote for. But at it, from my perspective, at its level or at, at its base level, People have not done a lot of work in untangling those emotions um, about an understanding why they feel the way that they feel. And are you kind of replacing one thought or emotion for another when, when you know? So he, I'm just fascinated by human nature in general. And I because I study economics and finance and that inevitably pulls in what's happening geopolitically around the world. Absolutely. So it's, a, it's just a fascinating study. Um, the interesting thing about um, modern mass politics uh, is that uh, it is largely beliefs that people don't engage creatively, right? Or creatively, right? Mm. It's not coming from within. It's a reaction and then like a comfortable thing that they put on to deal with their insecurities or their fears or whatever. It's a good uh, way. Both sides, any side, it, really. Yeah, it's, it, that's, it's human nature, right? So the idea is, you're right, but like uh, what we could aspire to was would be to uh, dig deep into ourselves, figure out our values, and figure out how uh, we can use belief, we can use faith that all is well, yeah. correlate it to this belief, right? Like that's the leavening ingredient, right? Like you can believe, I mean, there are a lot of different ways to look at the world and see truth. And to see something worth aspiring towards. Uh, but it is the faith that all is well and that there's not a huge, like, nasty emergency because things aren't exactly the way that you want it that gives you the perspective. Because at the end of the day, the world isn't going to be planned into peace. Yeah. It's going to be all of our hearts and minds engaged and our spirits engaged in this process of balancing, healing, forgiving you know, offering restitution, all of the things that are going to need be needed because it's going to be needed. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, it will. It will. Well, my that's friend, for fourth density. That's for fourth <laughs> density. I can't wait to get there. Well, we just got to open our hearts and then the easy, <laughs> then the hard part will be done. Then we can just get to the work of actually healing. Mm. Well, we'll call it there on that note. We've really enjoyed this, and thanks for your patience with us. Uh, please stay in the love and light, friends.